Good morning. I have a, a little different reading this morning from Romans 7, 14 to 25 from the message. So the wording here will be quite different probably than what, what you would normally expect. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I've spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is then necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law, but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it is predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. So I have a question for you. Sorry for that was a little loud. Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want God to have His way in your life? Oh, Christian, that's something we have to decide whether we're going to keep living our lives for ourselves or we really do want God's will to be done so that His kingdom will come. And I'll talk more about kingdom in the very closing, just so you understand that. If you'll bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. For you are an awesome, mighty God, loving and compassionate, stiff-necked, Lord, and just so forgiving, so merciful, so loving, so kind, words cannot even describe, that you would send your Son to die for our sins, that our price, our penalty for our sins would be paid. And not only that, Lord, but the power of sin controlling our life is no longer there. Because when Jesus died and ascended into heaven, rose again and ascended to heaven, He said that He would not orphan us. And You have come to dwell with us. Lord, help us to understand as we read through the Old Testament all of the, this pointing to Jesus Christ and how we're supposed to live our life now as a result of His finished work on the cross. Lord, help us to yield to the power of the Spirit each and every day for the mission of Jesus Christ in this world, to be His hands and feet, to spread the gospel message, not just with words, but through everything that we do, Lord. Help us to live a life that is pleasing to You, offering up spiritual sacrifices, that they may be a pleasing aroma to You, Lord, no matter what the cost, because it costs Jesus everything to redeem us. Father, let us hear the words of the Spirit today and not just be listeners, Lord, but be obedient, Lord, to, to want to be like Jesus so we submit to your will and usher in the kingdom of God into this world. We long for Jesus' return when he makes all things new again, Lord, and we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I call this, entitled this, A Matter of Heart. And the reason that I had Mark read from Romans 7 is because if you read and understand, you know that Romans 8 talks about life in the Spirit. There is no way that a Christian can be born again without being born from above, being born by the Spirit of God. And there's no way that a Christian, literally what the word means, can be like Christ unless we grow up in maturity by guidance of the Spirit who will teach us everything that Jesus taught and guide us into all truth. If you read your reading this week, you should have read from Sam, 1 Samuel chapter 25 to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 
in 1 Timothy 2 to 6 and 1 John chapters 1 and 2. Now, I've got to remind you of this before I get started, okay? When the church first came into being after Pentecost, they met together daily and talked about the scriptures. So I've got to cram that all in one message, okay? Because when I, don't have, an out, when I have, don't have a sermon in front of me and I only have scriptures, I can be longer than normal. <laughs> but I'll try to watch the time and everything because all I have down here is scriptures and you give me just a few verses and I can go on for hours. <laughs> okay? I told you last week I confess that I didn't make it through the reading in Samuel and I know why because I want to present Samuel more to you this week and I'm only going to talk briefly about 1 Timothy and about John because we're going to cover John next week. We're going to finish Samuel. You're going to read, start reading Nahum and, and you're going to start reading Colossians. So this week I want to talk a good bit about Samuel and what you should have read there and what you should have kind of understood. It's not just a history, Samuel's not. It's a character study so that you can see what men of God are like, what kings are like, and understand kings and kingdoms in this world. And I know that is foreign to us in the United States. We want democracy and we want to say so and everything. But in a kingdom, you pledge your allegiance to the king, period. You fight for the king, you do whatever for the king, and if the king is a good king, then he is just and fair, he helps the people, he fights oppression, he takes care of the poor. And if it's a king of God, then he is even more and more like God in those characteristics. It's a character study that should be applied to your life and how you live it for God's kingdom. Matthew 26, verse 36 to 41. At that time, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he told them, sit here for a while while I go over there and pray. And you've heard me say before many times that we neglect that prayer when we go out into battle. We covered Ephesians 6 and covered the, the, the armor of God and everything that's there, and it ended with pray, 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 and pray more. Verse 37, He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is consumed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little while further, he, faced, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then Jesus returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Were you not able to keep watch with me for one hour? He, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall, enter into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Just like the words that Paul wrote in Romans. That you want to do what you know is right to do, but you can't do it on your own. And that's the story of the flesh. The story of kings and kingdoms of this world, even the kings and kingdoms of Israel. That without God's daily guidance, without being born of the Spirit and being led by the Spirit, but without leading a life of prayer, without a desire to be like Jesus in this world and grow to maturity then you're going to constantly, constantly, constantly fail. Now, are you going to fail regardless? Probably. Oh, that's talking about 1 John a little bit. If you do sin, we do have an advocate with the Father. But the thing is, is we try our best not to sin, not by our own might, but by yielding to submission of Jesus Christ, of God, through the Spirit, so that we are more like Him, so that our mind is renewed so that our heart is molded and transformed and changed and softened, so that these things of this world grow strangely dim. We fix our eyes on Jesus and look forward to His coming, and we look for building up treasures in heaven, not here on earth. And knowing that Jesus Christ went through everything in the flesh, that's why I started with this scripture, that we faced. He struggled with the flesh. But what did He do? He prayed, and He let the Spirit empower Him. And what did the disciples do at the same time? Slept. How about all those scriptures? Awake! The time has come. The day is closer for your salvation. Jesus said this to his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 7, But I tell you the truth, it is for your benefit that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Verse 12, I still have so much to tell you, but you cannot bear to hear it. However, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. You cannot do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. 
It is the power to save you. He is the power to save you. Forgive me that I said it. He is the power to save you. He is the one that will guide you into all truth. He is your comforter and everything that you need on this earth and will lead you into all truth, sanctify you through and through. It is better that Jesus was not here than the Spirit is here to guide you in each and every step. So Romans 8 says, in verse 15, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery that returns you to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Wow. The children of Israel would never even comprehend such a blasphemous statement to them, that we can call our, da our dad, literally, Call upon Him and He will answer us. What good earthly father does not want to give good gifts? How much more does your Father in Heaven want to give you the Holy Spirit to protect you, to guide you, to lead you, to make you into the image of Christ? Luke 10, verse 21 to 24, At that time Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And He declared, I praise you, Father, Lord of Heaven and Earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. All you need is that kind of faith where that child trusts you to provide for them, to take care of them, everything else. Dad will take care of it. Is that the kind of faith that you have, Christian? Yes, my Father, for this is well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been entrusted to me by the Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. No one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Then Jesus turned to His disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desire to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. So we're going to get to our story of kings and kingdoms in a second. That's why I'm just setting up for us so we understand it a little better. So if we go back to Romans 8, 26 and 27, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, whatever that might be, so that we can live a life of faith so that we can live a life that brings glory and honor to God. So we can take our will and put it aside and replace it with God's will. So that we don't live for our kingdom and our desires, but for His kingdom. The flesh is weak, and Jesus teaches us to pray, and the Spirit teaches us to pray here. Verse 27, and He who searches our hearts... Oh, excuse me, I'll finish with verse 26 first. In the same way the Spirit helps in our weakness, for we don't know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so many times here when you read that passage, you think, oh, I don't have the words to say, but the Holy Spirit will pray for me. Well, if the Holy Spirit is praying for you, isn't the Holy Spirit also teaching you how to pray? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. And take the helmet of salvation, your identity in Christ, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, God's Word revealed in you to hear and obey, to empower your lives by the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit at all times, because the Spirit is teaching you how to pray with every kind of prayer and petition. To this end, stay alert with all the perseverance in your prayers for all the saints. Okay, are we ready to, to join this kingdom? Well, you've, I hope you've already joined this kingdom and its king. Are you ready to pledge your allegiance? Are you ready to reaffirm your allegiance if that's what it is? Because we fight a spiritual battle. Our lives are not our own. They've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. But so many times, so many days, every day for me, I want to get up and fight my own battle under my own strength and my own might with my own agenda. But this is not who we are. Our identity is in Jesus Christ. The songs that Sherry picked out fit so perfectly. Do you want to be like Jesus? Uh, I mean, we go through things where we put the bracelets on, what would Jesus do and things like that. We know what Jesus did. We know what He calls us to do. And the Spirit is changing us into the image of Christ as we submit to Him. Are you doing that? So the book of Samuel is about the last judge. You remember judges when we went through that? The people did what they felt was right in their eyes, and then the world was chaos even in the land of Israel, wasn't it? But the judges were appointed by God, and they came and saved the people when they cry, cried out for help to God. He still saved them, even though they lived lives that did not glorify Him at all, even though they did not follow His commands as He warned them. 
the 12 tribes were divided and they did what was right, what was sensible in their own eyes. How many times do we do that? What seems sensible and right in our own eyes? Then the children of Israel demanded a king so they could be like the other nations. Weren't we supposed to stamp out all of that and live for God and for His kingdom? So they got united under King Saul, a king that looked like he should be a king, that was head and shoulders over the others, that had the abilities that we would look for in an earthly king. But pride was his downfall, wasn't it? Lack of faith and trust was his downfall. So God sought out another king, a man after his own heart. But as we read the story, we see that that king is very fallible as well. Oh, so am I. But the difference is, is when I do fall, I realize that I've sinned against my Father in heaven and I ask His forgiveness. And I live by His redemptive power and His grace and mercy to be more like Christ. I know the name Jesus Christ. I know what He's done. The things that the prophets and kings desired to long for, and they didn't know Jesus Christ, His name. You do. So will you pledge your allegiance to Him? Or will you continue to long for the things of the world and live like the world? David was that man, even though he sinned, it was a man after God's own heart. And he truly repented, which is the kind of heart that God could use, the kind of heart that God sought. Remember as you read the Old Testament that all Scripture points to Jesus Christ. This is a story about Samuel and a story about Saul and a story about David, but it's a story about men's failures and God's redemptive grace by a man who did do what God called him to do. Every bit of it, even though he prayed sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, even though his disciples abandoned him, even though the world mocked him and said, come off of that cross if you're who you say you are. But he did God's will, the Father's will, so that God's kingdom would come. Our story begins with a humble and heartbroken woman. <laughs> Seems like our story starts with women a lot, doesn't it? She's crying out to God, and he answers by a miraculous birth. A son who would judge his people. A son who would walk in his ways, but still fallible human being. 1 Samuel 1 verse 12, as Hannah kept on praying before the Lord, Eli watched her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart. And, through her, and though her lips were not moving, her voice could, could not be, and her voice could not be heard. So Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put away your wine. No, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have not had any wine or strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do you pour out your soul before the Lord? Do you pour out it only when things are oppressing you? Verse 27, I prayed for this boy, and since the Lord has granted me what I asked for, I now dedicate the boy to the Lord, for as long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord. Wow, what a beginning to our story. She cries out to God. God answers his, her prayers. And what does she say back? No, nah, this is not my son that I'm going to keep and do what I want to do with. She said, he's yours, God. Because all blessings come from God. Grace upon grace upon grace. He brings rain and sun to the wicked as well as the righteous. And there are none righteous, no, not one. And He has made you rich so that you can be rich to others. He has called you out of the darkness into the light so you can be a child of light, a child of love as we read in, further in John when we do. 1 Samuel chapter 2, Now the sons of Eli were wicked men. They did not follow in the ways of the Lord. They had no regard for the Lord. Verse 34, And this sign shall come to you concerning your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They will both die on the same day. More of God's sovereignty. He does what He wants to do. And you need to realize that. And you need to walk in the ways of the Lord regardless. Then I'll raise up for myself a faithful priest. He will do whatever is in my heart and mind, and I will build for him an enduring house, and he will walk before, before my anointed one for all times. Samuel did not write the words on his doorpost like he should have. 
Then his children still have to decide. But shouldn't you live a life that brings glory and honor to God so that your children have something to pattern their lives after? Imitate me as I imitate Christ is what Paul always said. Who gave up this world so that he could live for the King of kings and Lord of lords because he met him that day on the road to Damascus and it changed him. It's a foretelling of David, but of course it's a foretelling of Jesus. First Samuel chapter 3, And the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Now in those days the word, the, the word of the Lord was rare and visions were scarce. Why is that? Because they continually turned their backs, hardened their hearts. They were stiff-necked, rebellious people. He guided them through the wilderness with the power of the Spirit day and night so they could see where they're going. And Jesus told us the same thing. Walk while you have the light so that you can be children of light. 1 Samuel 3 verse 4, Then the Lord called to Samuel and he answered, Here I am. Verse 17, What was the message he gave you, Eli asked? Do not hide it from me. May God punish you and ever so severely if you hide from me anything he said to you. So Samuel told him everything and did not hide a thing from him. I mean, how would you take that news that your children are both going to, your sons are both going to die? Would you say, you're sovereign, Lord? Your will be done, your kingdom come? Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Romans 8 tells us that God works out all things for good for those who love him. Do you believe that? Is that the life that you live? 1 Samuel chapter 4, So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and each man fled to his tent. The slaughter was great. 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. The ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. And then Eli falls over dead as well. Chapters 5 and 6, The Philistines take the ark back to God, but they kill themselves. The ark was thought of to be the power, the source of power for God, a showpiece. You have the power of God that was hovering over creation, creating the power of, the, of God that raised Jesus from the dead. He lives in you to make you like Christ in this world and forevermore. I can't stress that anymore. So who is the Spirit to you? Is it just a seal that you're God's child? Is He just a seal? Or is He the power that is transforming you through and through? 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 6. When they gathered at Mizpah, they drew water and poured it out before the Lord. On that day they fasted and they confessed, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the Israelites at Mizpah. So the Philistines were subdued and they stopped invading the territory of Israel and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. We see the period of Judges coming to an end and if you think back or if you want to even do more than that, go back and read, go back and read and look at the different Judges and see how they were fallible men and women but God still used them. He can use you and I. <laughs> there is no reason that God can't use the worst of the worst or the best of the best in our own eyes because it's not by our power or might, it's by the Holy Spirit that we will live a life of worth. 1 Samuel chapter 8, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, but his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside towards dishonest gain, accepting bribes, perverting justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Look, they said, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to judge us like the other nations that desire still to be like whoever. The grass is always greener over there, isn't it? <laughs> Until you get there and find out it doesn't look much different than your own sometimes. Why do we long for the things of the world? Jesus tells us not to worry about what we eat, not to worry about what we wear. So much money in this world is spent on what we eat and what we wear. Why do we worry about those things? Doesn't your Heavenly Father know that you need them? Won't you, if you pray earnestly, won't He give you 
more of the Holy Spirit that He has sealed you with for the day of redemption so that you can be like Christ, so that you can fulfill the mission that Jesus Christ has given you to love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself so that you don't have a problem with the love your enemy. You don't have a problem with jealousy and greed. You don't have a problem turning the other cheek. Oh, so that you can go out and spread the gospel messages you have the opportunity because of the way you live your lives and you can train up disciples, don't forget that part, to obey everything that Jesus has told you because you're living a life of obedience that you cannot do without the power of God living in you through the Holy Spirit. Or do you long for the things of this world? And if you long for the things of, your world, of this world, how are your children going to live? But when they said, verse 6, but when they said, give us a king to judge us, their demands were, were displeasing in the sight of Samuel. So he prayed the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people. Do what they say. For it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Are you seeing a pattern here? It's about kings and kingdoms, and you will serve one master or the other, Jesus said, and you will be with him in gathering, or you will be with the devil and scattering. If you're born again, you have a life to live on this earth by the power of the Holy Spirit to be like Christ and to gather, to produce fruit because you are grafted into the vine and you get your life from Jesus Christ who lived and died for you. Verse 8, Just as they have done from, this day, from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Verse 9, now listen to them, but you must solemnly warn them and show them the manner of the king who will reign over them. This is setting up the pattern for the rest of First and Second Samuel. Oh, and First and Second Samuel is just one work. It's divided up because of scroll length. It's a history, but like I said, it's a lesson for us to look at and especially look at the individuals and see the difference because David committed some pretty atrocious sins. His faith faltered a lot. But he repented. Read some of the Psalms that he wrote and everything. He repented and knew that God was his strength, his stronghold. He fixed his eyes upon Jesus and he foretold about Jesus without even knowing it. Verse 19, Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we must have a king over us. Then, he will, then we will be like other nations with a king to judge us, to go out before us and to fight our battles. Battle's already won, guys. <laughs> if anything happens to you, as Paul said, if for me to die is gain, I will be forever in the presence of God. But your mission is still here today if you're not dead, if you're breathing. Are you eating the bread of life and drinking living water so that springs of living water flow through you? 1 Samuel chapter 9, Now there was a Benjamite, a powerful man, whose name, who was the son of Kit. Who was, whose name was Kish, son of Abel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becheroth, the son of Aphtha and Benjamin. I got all that out. And he had a son named Saul, choice and handsome, without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any other people. Boy, it seems like this could be the man that can save us, huh? when we put our eyes on things of this world. Oh, if only I had this or that, I would be okay. And then, Lord, I'll serve you because my needs will be met. What about that daily bread? Do you trust God enough to give up whatever, to go follow after what He's called you to do? Or do you think we need all of these things? Oh, by the way, Saul's story starts with him chasing donkeys, doesn't it? And it kind of ends the same way. Chasing after the things of this world that we think are foolish, but it's our only jackasses, right? Verse 21, Saul replied, I am, not a Benjam I am, am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of Benjamin? So why would you say such a thing to me? Boy, that's a good start. Do you realize who you were? You were wretched, pitiful, naked, and blind. I don't care who you were, what you had in this world, what you think about your righteousness. You were as filthy rags. But Jesus called you out of the darkness to live in the light, to be a child of light. 
as though God were making His reconciliation through you, this gospel, this good news of Jesus Christ, having that armor where your, your feet are ready to go wherever God takes you because you have the gospel of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 9, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all the signs came to pass. They had their king, but would they follow God's warning? Would Saul stay loyal to God? Verse 19, but today you have rejected your king, who saves you from all of your troubles and afflictions, and you have said to him, No. Set, us a, set a king over us. And in 1 Samuel chapter 11, we see that Paul does def, I mean Saul does defeat the Amorite, Ammonites. He goes out and fights a battle, and the people see that, that the things that they desire are happening. If only they had driven out all the nations prior to this, instead of intermarrying and taking on their gods and their lifestyles, instead of longingly looking back to Egypt. 1 Samuel chapter 12, now there was verse 13. Now here is the king you have chosen, the one you requested. Behold, the Lord has placed a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice, and if you do not rebel against the command of the Lord, boy, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? All the way back to the Exodus. Oh, but we add this to it. And if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, then all will be well. Oh, praise God for King Jesus, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, are you doing it today? Because He is our leader who we fix our eyes upon, who we run this race together with perseverance, shedding off anything that hinders us and the sins that entangle us. Verse 18, So Samuel called the Lord, and on that day the Lord sent thunder and rain. As a result, all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. They pleaded with Samuel, Pray the Lord our God for, our, for your servants so that we will not die. For we have added to our sins the evil of asking for a king. So today we live in a country where the church is afraid to be the hands and feet. Oh yeah, I'm saying this, aren't I? So they look to the government for security and safety and well-being because the church isn't really being the hands and feet that they should be for whatever reasons. Do not be afraid, Samuel replied. Even though you have committed all this evil, do not turn aside from the Lord God, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Joshua and Caleb did, Caleb did that, and they entered into the promised land, didn't they? Received their inheritance. They still had to fight for it. And they were, Caleb was 80 years old when he had to fight the giants in the land. But he knew that he wasn't fighting them. He knew that God's power was fighting them. Do not turn aside after worthless things that cannot profit you or deliver you, for they are empty. I'm going to read that one again. Do not turn aside after worthless things they cannot profit you or deliver you, for they are empty. Indeed, for the sake of his great name. The Lord will not abandon His people because He is pleased to make you His own. Wow! And Jesus called me out of the light, out of the darkness into the light to be a child of light because He loved me and gave Himself for me. As for me, far be it from, from, from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And I will continue to teach you the good and right way. Above all, fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things He has done for you. And again, they did not know anything but the hope of Jesus Christ coming. But if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. Chapter 13, verse 8. And Saul waited for seven days for the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the troops began to desert Saul. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And he offered up the burnt offering. Seems like something reasonable to me, doesn't it? But God's clear in His commands. Oh, let me sit down and spend time seeing what Jesus commanded me to do. If you want to be my disciple, I'm just going to go with this one. <laughs> Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after me. 
Am I listening to the king's commands, obeying his voice, fighting the good fight, finishing the race so that I'm not disqualified? Just as he finished offering the burnt offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done, Samuel asked. And Saul replied, when I saw, oh, there we go, when I, that the troops were deserting me and that you did not come at the appointed time and the Philistines were gathering at Mishnah, I thought, now the Philistines will descend upon me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. There's too many eyes in there, isn't there? So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have acted foolishly, Samuel declared. You have not kept the, the command that the Lord your God gave you. Is Jesus your king? Are you keeping his commands? Are you ushering in the kingdom of heaven because you're being a good and faithful servant, slave? If you had, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler over his people because you have not kept the command of the Lord. Hear and obey, O Israel. I've said before, I'm going to say it again. The word means the same thing. There's one word. Hear and obey it. As a father, if I tell my son, go clean your room, he heard it. If he doesn't go clean his room, he has disobeyed his father. And there will be consequences. 1 Samuel chapter 14, all goes south pretty fast. Saul becomes more and more prideful and turns further and further into the darkness. He even tries to, he makes a foolish vow and tries to kill his son, Jonathan. Are we learning anything from this character study? Are we examining our own lives so that asking God to examine our hearts? 1 Samuel 15, he disobeys God again and keeps the spoils of battle. Verse 22, but Samuel declared, does not the Lord does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obedience to his voice? No wonder on that day many will cry out, Lord, Lord, we did mighty works in your name. And Jesus will declare to them, I don't know you. They will try to plead their case and say, we even cast out demons in your name. Come on, that's got to be something. Depart from me, I do not know you. Behold, obedience is better than sacrifice and attentiveness is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance is like the wickedness of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now, as we read on, we see that Saul even does do practice divination. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But if you start down the wrong path, then you're listening to the voice of someone other than the Spirit of God. And we fight that spiritual battle against spiritual forces in heavenly places. And the devil is like a lion waiting to see who he may devour. Do you understand that? So when you quit listening to the Spirit's voice or say you're listening but you're putting off the Spirit's voice for today, boy, you're putting yourself into a dangerous place. 1 Samuel 16, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long... Are you going to mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. For I have selected from him the son, uh, from his sons a king for myself. And even Samuel thinks that it's going to be the big, tall, rugged guy. It's not going to be the run of the litter. And if you study more and you do word studies on it, it even looks like David might be that last unwanted child. It wasn't maybe not even planned. I'm putting that in there, but it seems, sure seems to be that way. Verse 6, when they arrived, Samuel saw Elab and said, Surely here before the Lord is his anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not see as man does, for man sees the outward appearance, but the Lord sees the heart. 
So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. After the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, a spirit of distress from the Lord began to torment him. Now there we go when we turn away. It doesn't mean that God sent a demon to him to oppress him, but it means that he put his, took his hand off of him and that gave the demon opportunity to come in and fill that house. Jesus teaches about those principles. Make sure you sweep your house out good and keep it swept out and it's not you doing it. It's the one dwelling in you again. <clears throat> David comes to play for Saul and that brings him some temporary comfort. 1 Samuel 17, David fights Goliath. If you read that, you'll see the contempt that his brothers have for him as the run of the litter. Verse 45 reads, But David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. David wouldn't put on Saul's armor. Thank goodness it was too big and bulky, because in his own mind he might have thought, I need this fleshly king's armor. But since it didn't fit, David said, Oh, wait a minute, I don't need the physical king's armor. I need God's armor. He hadn't even read Ephesians yet, had he? I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Not I'll deliver you into the Lord's hand, but the Lord will deliver. This day I will strike you down, cut off your head, and give the carcass to the Philistines, to the birds of the air and the creatures of the earth. Then the whole world will know that there is a God of Israel, giving God the glory. And all those assembled here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. 1 Samuel 18, Saul goes further and further away from the light and into the darkness, and as the woman danced, they sang out, verse 7, Saul has slayed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Why would that matter to you? Except that your heart has already gone the wrong way and hardened that a spirit of evil has already come in and been talking to you because you've been denying the spirit of God that has been talking to you. <clears throat> and Saul was furious and resented this song. They have ascribed tens of, thin, tens of thousands to David, he said, but only thousands to me. <clears throat> what more can he have but my kingdom? I put my in there, my says the... Just letting you know I put that in there because that's how I would feel if I wasn't compelled to listen to the Spirit. And from that day forward, Saul kept a jealous eye on D David. No wonder Jesus had to expound upon the truth because we don't want to see the truth when he climbed up on the mount and said that if you have had hatred in your heart, you're guilty of murder. Now Saul's da daughter, verse 20, Michael loved David and when... This was reported to Saul. It pleased him. <laughs> I will give her to David, Saul thought, so that she may be a snare to him. And the hands of the Philistine may be against him. So Saul said to David for a second time, Now you can be my son-in-law. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved David, he grew even more afraid of David. So from then on, Saul was David's enemy. Boy, look how fast this story has turned. And who are you except God gave you the breath of life and gave you new life in Jesus Christ? He created for you, for you for His purpose and His image to thank Him, to give Him glory and honor, to worship Him. And how much more should we, knowing what Jesus has done and having the Spirit to lead us into all truth? 1 Samuel chapter 19, Then Saul ordered his son Jonathan and all his servants to kill David. But Jonathan delighted greatly in David, so he warned David. And David goes to see Samuel. 1 Samuel 20, Jonathan confirms his father's intention, and they reaffirm their covenant with one another. 1 Samuel 21, David gets Goliath's sword, goes into hiding, and as a result of his hiding and depending on the Lord to bring about what the Lord has said He would do in your life, we have many of the Psalms that we have today. So what has God promised you in your life? Not a hair on your head will be harmed without Him knowing it and being in His will. And when you die, you will spend an eternity with Him. 
So why would you not live for him today by the power of the Spirit? 1 Samuel 22, Saul kills the priests and everyone in the town. This story is getting really dark. 1 Samuel chapter 23, Saul cl closes in on David, but he leaves because God gives him a message that the Philistines are attacking. God saves David because David's his anointed one. 1 Samuel 24, David has the opportunity to kill Saul, but he does not kill Saul because he still knows that Saul is still his anointed one, God's anointed one, until God takes his hand from him. Would you take matters into your own hand? I probably would. That takes a heart focused on God to not say, here's my opportunity to do what God has planned for me to do. No wonder we should pray, pray, pray. And when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit will pray for us, and the Spirit is teaching us to pray while we're doing that. Be careful and, and acknowledge that. 1 Samuel chapter 25, Samuel dies. The story of David continues. And right then we see him taking on another wife. <laughs> and another wife, plus the one he's got back home. How many wives did his son have? 1 Samuel chapter 26, David could have killed Saul again, but he doesn't. And this time Saul goes home and gives, brings a little bit of peace to David. But 1 Samuel 20, chapter 27, David goes to live among the Philistines because he thinks he'll be safe and things will be better there for him. See how quickly the story changes when we don't focus our eyes on God's deliverance and His plan in our lives? 1 Samuel chapter 28, David becomes the bodyguard for the king, for the Philistine king. And Saul seeks out the witch of Endor. Wow. And I told you, remember back to 1 Samuel chapter 15, rebellion, because that's what Saul is doing, is like the sin of divination. Now he's consulting evil spirits. Boy. I didn't even realize I was listening to spiritual darkness and now I'm consulting. The further we get away from the light, the more the darkness grows. 1 Samuel chapter 29, the Philistines head to battle. Um, but they don't trust David and they send him away. 1 Samuel chapter 30, when David arrives at Zik Ziklag, he finds that his two wives have been captured. Verse 7, Then David says to Abathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. So Abathar brought, brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord. Ah, he's getting back on the right path. Should I pursue these raiders? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, the Lord replied, for you will surely overtake them and rescue the captives. He thought he'd be better off in the land of the Philistines, but circumstances brought him out of there. God's hand had his... Had his uh, we determine our steps, but God knows and directs our paths, period. God had planned for him what to do. Ephod, if you don't know it, means breastplate. Back to that armor of God that protects your heart so that the Spirit can take that heart of flesh that God gave you when He called you into His redemptive arms through, through the blood of Jesus Christ and he can mold it and soften it so that you're like Jesus. They, they went into battle and they won and the men wanted to keep the spoils of the war from the ones that didn't go fight but David said no that wouldn't be right. God gave so we're going to give. 1 Samuel chapter 31 the Philistines attack and Saul's life is taken and his sons and armor bearer die that day just as God said. Now this is a good breaking point in division for the scroll. It's one continuous work because we see Saul's story come to an end, a tragic end. And you see the story of his sons come to a tragic end. Fighting in a physical battle, but we've been told in the New Testament that our battle is not physical, it's spiritual. This body is temporary. It is a tent why in the world would you want to focus what you have 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years, whatever you have in this body, or even less? 
Why would you not want to focus on what's eternal? Why would you want to not listen to the Spirit at any point who is guiding you into all truth, making you like Jesus Christ? So 2 Samuel chapter 1 opens with the death of King Saul and David mourns. And now our focus is on the rise of King David. But we see many of the struggles that he has and we see what happens more to him when he becomes king. Especially where we stopped our reading this week because he's sitting high on top of a roof overlooking his kingdom when he should have been out in battle with his men. And he looks down and sees this pretty woman. And where does he go from there? 2 Samuel chapter 1 opens with, with the death of Saul and the rise of David, but it differs greatly because we see the humility of David. And we see the repentance of David when he starts having pride in his heart. The story is full of sins, jealousy, lust, even murder. The doing what's right in our own eyes because as earthly kings under our own thought and our own heart, we're doomed. Oh, thanks be back to Romans chapter 7 that our answer is Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 8 is the only way I can live like Jesus is to live by the power of the Spirit and know that God works all things together for good for those who love Him. Can you see the story of Samuel unfolded there in Romans chapter 7 and 8? 2 Samuel chapter 2, David becomes king of the southern tribe and Ishbosheth is made king of the northern tribe. Why is there continued struggling among God's children? Why is the church effectively not the church as much as we should be today? Because we can't get along over, over religious beliefs, doctrines, uh, denominations, and the days we meet. Oh, I think the New Testament clearly says those things shouldn't be stumbling blocks. And f don't even put in the false doctrines out there that are leading people away. If we were all united together by the power of Spirit like the early church and not worry about any of the things we have, but focus on the mission that we know that Jesus Christ gave us. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples thereof, teaching them to obey everything. Second Samuel chapter 3, David grows in power. Abner pledges his allegiance. However, Joab kills him. We take into our hands again, thinking what, what is right in our own eyes. Second Samuel chapter 4, Ishbosheth is murdered in his sleep. They cut off his head and bring it to David. So David in turn kills the brothers who did this. He even cuts off their, the men of Israel, doesn't say David did, even cut off their hands and feet and hung the bodies in public. Wow, where we go based on our own thoughts and jealousies and everything else. We live in this cursed world because of our sin. And Jesus Christ died breaking the curse so that you could live in freedom. He who believes in the Son of God is free indeed. Boy, we need a king, a true king that we can follow, a true king that we can pattern our lives after, a true king that gives us the authority and the power to bring about the message of reconciliation, to live of hope, not of this world, but of things for eternal. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord. Are you doing it now? 2 Samuel chapter 5, David is made king of all of Israel at the age of 30, ironically. <laughs> Calls his new home the city of David. David realized, chapter 5 verse 12, and David realized that the Lord established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. After he had arrived from Hebron, David takes more concubines and wives from Jerusalem and more sons and daughters were born to him. How often is it that we realize we're a child of God, but we still live like a child living in darkness rather than a child of light? When we realize that we're all sinners, that it's God's grace that saved us, but we forget about verse 10 of Ephesians 2, 9, that we are his masterpiece. 
His workmanship in Christ Jesus to do good works as He planned before we even knew time. 2 Samuel chapter 6, David assembles 30,000 men to move the ark. And it looks like the ark's going to fall and hit the ground. Oh, by my own fault, mine again. Grab that thing. <laughs> but do what God has commanded you. He set it apart to be holy. It's not anything else. Oh, your body is a temple. The temple of God and the Holy Spirit resides in you. Quit trying to do everything by your own might and power and let God transform you into the image of Christ. 2 Samuel chapter 7, After the king had settled in the palace, the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. He said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in the house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. And Nathan replied to God, Go and do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that night the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and tell my servant David that this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build for me a house to dwell in? God has built a house to dwell in and that's you and I. Do you realize that? So many Christians are more about Casper the friendly ghost than they know about the Holy Ghost. It's, it's so sad. It's not about you. Everything is about God's purpose, His glory. Are you building His kingdom by being obedient to Him? Verse 16, For your house and kingdom will endure forever before me, and your throne will be established forever. Not because of you, David, but because of me. Pointing to Jesus Christ. Verse 18, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? How great you are, O Lord, for there is none like you, and there is no God but you. Boy, David does repent, doesn't he? But it takes daily prayer, daily repentance, daily guidance by the Spirit, or we turn out to be in the place we don't want to be, doesn't it? 2 Samuel 8, 9, and 10, David continues to conquer, continues to serve justly as a king until 2 Samuel chapter 11. Did you read? What's 2 Samuel chapter 11? Where he sits securely, comfortably in his easy chair, surveying his kingdom and sees Bathsheba. And lust in his heart leads to adultery and murder. Who would have ever, ever, ever thought that could have happened to David? You can probably look back into your life and say, Who would ever, how would I have ever thought that I did this? Continually fixing, fixing, fixating our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our souls. 1 Timothy chapter 6, you read it this week. Verse 9 says, Those who want to be rich, however, fall into temptation and become ensnared many foolish and harmful desires that plunge in them into ruin and darkness. We've got to get rid of the longings of this world and realize that you're going to be rich for Jesus. Verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all kind of evils. By craving it, some have wandered away from the faith, piercing themselves with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee, run from these things. And instead of running to these things, run towards, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith and take hold of the eternal life that you were called. In verse 17, instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be conceited and not to put their hope in uncertainty of wealth, but in God who richly provides all things for us to enjoy. Instruct them to do good and to be rich in good works and to be generous and ready to share, treasuring up for themselves a firm foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what that which is truly life. And we'll talk more about 1 John next week, but 1 John 2, whoever claims to abide in Him must walk as Jesus walked. Verse 15, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, the desires of flesh, the desires of the eye, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God remains forever. Wake up! It's not a time of darkness. It's not a time of sleep. It's a time to be light in this dark, dark world. 
If you can't see the story of Samuel in the kingdom of the United States and the kingdom of the world today, then you're simply not looking. What did Jesus teach? What did He teach you? What are His commands? What did He speak about more than anything? Yeah, I don't have to have a verbal answer, but I'm waiting for you to answer in your mind. Oh, you'll say love your enemy. You'll say love the Lord. You'll say do good deeds to, 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 to be a witness. Do you know what the word boredom means? Dumb. It's the state of. The state of being bored. Do you know what kingdom means? We think of it as a place. But it's not a place. It's a way of life. It means the state of the king reigning. And Jesus talked about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven more than anything. The other things were how you lived as a result of the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus stayed 40 more days, He gave them convincing proofs that He was alive, alive and talked about the kingdom of heaven so that you would live and pledge your allegiance to Jesus and usher in the kingdom of heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. That's why we need to rely on the Spirit and not worry about the things of our own. So I have to ask you, are you living for the shepherd king? Not David, but Jesus. Have you been set free to live for him? Matthew 4, chapter 7. For, chapter 4, verse 17, and then verse 19. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Then his very next words recorded in Matthew were, Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Father in heaven, we pray that your kingdom does come, that your will is done, that independently and collectively we live as the church, the children of God, that we are a light to this world, that we examine our lives through Scripture, we pray, O oh Lord, that you examine our hearts. If you find anything in us, Lord, bring it to our attention before we get further and further away from you. May we repent and turn to you because we know that you are loving and kind and gentle. Help us to take on the yoke of Jesus, to do the work with him. And we thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, Lord. We thank you for his atoning sacrifice that that you accepted once and for all. And Lord, help us to by the power of the Spirit hear and obey your words and cry out to you as our Father and show others the fact that we are your children by the way that we profess and the way we live. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.